in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 39. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them to not tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Recently, I watched the 1990 movie, The Long Walk Home. Set in Alabama, it's based on a screenplay about the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. The play and the movie are based on what actually happened to the play's author, John Cork, and his maid, Elizabeth Gregory. In the movie, Miriam Thompson sees her black maid, Odessa, repeatedly arrive for work, late and exhausted. Odessa has to explain that because of the bus boycott aimed to end segregation, she is walking for miles to and from work every day. Even though Miriam has been supporting segregation in her daily life, she begins to feel guilty and to have compassion for Odessa as a person, as a woman who's just trying to make a living and raise her family. Miriam offers to give Odessa a ride two days a week to ensure that she gets to work on time and to lessen her fatigue from the long walk home. Around the city, some informal carpools are starting but most of the Blacks are forced to walk to work. As the boycott continues, tensions rise in the city. Blacks have been the majority riders on the city-owned buses, and the system is suffering financially. Miriam's decision to support Odessa by giving her a ride becomes an issue with Miriam's husband and other prominent men in the white community who want the boycott to end. One day, Miriam is caught at the carpool site. She must choose between what she believes is right or succumb to the pressure from her husband and their friends. After an argument with her husband and a violent altercation with some of the black, excuse me, some of the white businessmen, Miriam decides to follow her heart. In the film's final scene, we see Miriam and her young daughter join Odessa and the other protesters in standing against oppression. She could no longer follow the crowd that supported suppression. Today's gospel reading is about following. Up to now, Jesus has been the healer, 
the teacher, and the powerful enemy of evil spirits. He is the anointed one who will fulfill God's promise to Israel and restore her to her previous grandeur. Now, for the first time, Jesus is teaching his disciples about what is waiting for him in Jerusalem, that he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Peter takes Jesus aside and reprimands him. Peter reprimands Jesus, a suffering servant? Jesus, this is crazy talk. Come on, you've got to stop that kind of talk. You're going to scare off your followers. Now it's just been a short time since Peter was spot on with his understanding of Jesus. And it's at that time that Jesus renamed Simon as Peter, the rock, and gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now Peter is so far off the mark that Jesus calls him out in front of the other disciples. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are not settling your minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus is not trying to make some theological point here. In P Peter's rebuke, Jesus heard the voice of Satan tempting him once again, as he had in the wilderness. Jesus had a choice here. He could have listened to Peter and avoided his crucifixion. Satan had tempted Jesus with food when he was starving, and then with power and with wealth. Now, through Peter, Satan is offering Jesus a much easier path. Jesus, you could still be the Messiah without all that pain and suffering and humiliation. Just take the easy road. You can be victorious, powerful, worshipped by whom you conquer and that vast army of your followers. But Jesus would never follow anything except the Father's bidding. Jesus loved the Father and the Father's children too much to leave them in the dust of death. Jesus makes it clear that he was sent to be killed and rise again. Then, shockingly, he tells all within hearing, and if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, this is the first time Jesus has used the word cross. He compares being his disciples to the terrible picture of a condemned man carrying the beam of a cross on his shoulders to the place of execution. We've all heard the common expression, my cross to bear. Well, Jesus is not talking about enduring an abusive spouse or uncontrollable pain or the manipulation of a drug addicted child. He's saying that if we want to be called his follower, we better be willing to do what he did. John Lewis, the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee during the American Civil Rights Struggle, talked about what redemptive suffering is really like. Lewis said, if someone's being attacked and beaten, it is your responsibility to intervene to protect them. But intervening does not mean returning violence for violence to drive the attacker away. Intervening means stepping in and shielding your fellow marcher with your own body, accepting the blows yourself in order to save them, even at risk to your own life. That is taking up your cross. To take up our cross and follow Jesus means we follow him in refusing to think only about ourselves, but to suffer for the redemption of others, even if it risks us losing our lives. Our culture preaches self-fulfillment. However, Jesus says we must live in self-denial. 
we are to practice self-sacrificing love. <clears throat> and yet, because we are sinful creatures, even our sincere attempts to emulate the self-sacrificing love of Jesus are tainted and fall short. I will give a personal example, weak as it is, as a form of confession. This past week, I've been feeling restless and sorry for myself. Intellectually, I can reason that it was because I'm again facing the anniversary of the deaths of my husband and my son. Emotionally, I seek a way to be distracted. Suddenly, I'm tired of my old vehicles and I find myself coveting a new car. Now, mind you, there's nothing wrong with my Jeep or my car. And I could write a check for a new car, but it would mean that I'm using the money set aside to pay for my own care in my old age. If I use that money now, it means I could end up relying on government funds, thereby depriving someone else who cannot afford their own care. So I can try to justify driving my old rigs for a few more years to help care for the poor with a conservative use of my available funds. But then I hear Jesus say, if you truly want to serve me, you will sell both vehicles and give the money to the food bank. It's only two miles to the grocery store. You're capable of walking that. And I am. I even have a really nice wagon type cart that I could use to carry the groceries home. And so my magnanimous self-sacrifice has blown away like the dust that it is. I'm sure many of you have heard the expression, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, here's the origin of that sentence. At the height of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, when Christians were literally suffering and dying for justice and redemption there, Archbishop Desmond Tutu used to gather his staff around him in the mornings for prayer. And often as he was closing, he would ask, if being a Christian became a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Now, if there's not enough evidence to convict Desmond Tutu of being a Christian, God help us all. But he was asking it to keep himself and his staff focused on who and whose they were, rather than just what they were doing. They were not simply leaders of an important struggle for dignity and freedom. They were followers of Jesus Christ, insisting that all races and colors were loved equally by God and therefore should be treated equally in society and under the law. People had been able to see and hear them following Christ in their lives and ministry for their leadership to really make sense. In today's text, we see Jesus tell Peter to get behind him. This is so Peter would not become a stumbling block for him. A few verses later, we see Jesus tell the crowd that if they want to be with him, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow him. Either way, people must get behind Jesus. Once back there, we must decide to either emulate Jesus or to hold on to this life and be left in the dust. So decide today, will you get behind or be left behind? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God in Jesus Christ, who came to give us abundant life as followers on the way of faith, fill us with the strength to take up our cross and follow Jesus, that we might have the abundance of true life you intend for us and others may see your love and grace at work in us and follow with us as well. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.